Welcome to section 5 in musculoskeletal anatomy. In this section, we will discuss the elbow and the wrist joints. Let's first start by discussing the elbow. There are four main components you need to be aware of. The medial epicondyle, the lateral epicondyle, the supracondylar area, which is above both epicondyles, and the annular ligament. So let's start with the medial epicondyle. This is the site of medial epicondylitis, or ulnar nerve damage. So notice this image on the left is an anterior view of the elbow joint. Here we have the humerus, and we have the ulna on the medial side, and the radius on the lateral side. And looking to the image on the right, we can see the forearm flexors. The individual names of each of these muscles is not so important, but it is very important to know that these flexors flex the wrist, and they attach at the medial epicondyle of the humerus. On the previous slide, we mentioned medial epicondylitis. So what is medial epicondylitis? Well, repetitive wrist flexion can result in inflammation at the medial epicondyle, which results in pain. So overuse of the forearm flexors can result in pain, and this is called medial epicondylitis. On the previous slide, we also discussed how the ulnar nerve can also be damaged with damage to the medial epicondyle. And we can see the medial epicondyle labeled right here. So the ulnar nerve passes posterior, like this, and I'll just draw a dotted line to show that it's behind, and it continues that way. So if you damage the medial epicondyle, you can have ulnar nerve palsy. Now sometimes you may hit your arm here, leading to pain. It may hurt really, really bad. You may have heard somebody say, oh, I hit my funny bone. This is what they're referring to. So now that we've talked about the medial epicondyle, let's talk about the lateral epicondyle. The main thing to know about the lateral epicondyle is lateral epicondylitis. Now this follows the same exact principle as medial epicondylitis. Where medial epicondylitis was caused by repetitive flexion, lateral epicondylitis is caused by repetitive extension. And if lateral epicondylitis is caused by repetitive extension, then that must mean that the forearm extensors attach to the lateral epicondyle. Notice we have the lateral epicondyle here, and all of the forearm extensors, which you can see labeled on the right image, attach at this lateral epicondyle. So this is the posterior view of a person's right arm. So all these fibers are going up to attach to the lateral epicondyle. And overuse of these muscles can cause pain at the lateral epicondyle, lateral epicondylitis. Notice this tennis racket here. This athlete is demonstrating a backhand swing. This requires the forearm extensors running this way. Now if these muscles are overused or improperly used, it can cause pain here at the lateral epicondyle. So the humerus would run here, and the lateral epicondyle would be right here. And all these muscles allowing for wrist extension, as demonstrated here, attach at this lateral epicondyle. So overuse of wrist extension using the forearm extensors can cause lateral epicondylitis. So now that we've discussed the medial and lateral epicondyle, let's talk about the supracondylar area. The main thing to know about this area is it can be the site of supracondylar fracture. Now we discussed supracondylar fracture when we discussed the median nerve in a previous lecture. And what we stated before, and what we will reiterate here, is that damage to the supracondylar area can lead to median nerve damage. We won't go into any more detail here because it was covered so thoroughly in a previous lecture, but it is important to remember. Now let's talk about the annular ligament. Going back to this image, we can see the annular ligament labeled here. You can see the radius here below, and the radial head is right here. And if the annular ligament slips up above the radial head, this is called radial head subluxation. And this is very painful. And when it does occur, it's usually occurring in a child. It happens when the elbow is extended and pronated. Now this image depicts the arm of a toddler. Here is the humerus, here is the radius, and here is the ulna. If a caretaker pulls up on the child's arm, the elbow joint will extend, as shown here, and it can pronate. You can see the radius rotated anterior to the ulna, indicating pronation of the arm. Now let's superimpose the annular ligament. With this type of forceful hyperpronation, the radial head will slip out from under the annular ligament, like this. At least part of the radial head will slip out from underneath the annular ligament. This is called nursemaid's elbow, or radial head subluxation. So looking at this image, you can imagine that if the radial head pronates and the elbow extends, it would look something like this. The radius would go in this direction, pronating. And this would cause the annular ligament to slip up, causing radial head subluxation. Again, with the annular ligament, you just need to be aware of radial head subluxation. And this occurs from stretching of an extended and pronated arm. And the problem is that the annular ligament slips superiorly, ultimately leading to anterior subluxation of the radial head. Now that we've covered all the important anatomy of the elbow joint with this table, let's do a question to apply what you've learned. 
a 29-year-old military officer presents to the clinic for routine blood work. The phlebotomist palpates the arm in preparation for the procedure. The patient winces in pain when the area, labeled with a blue circle, is palpated. A nearby doctor suspects the pain is from an overuse injury. What innervates the forearm flexors? So hopefully you notice that this is the medial epicondyle, and the patient likely has medial epicondylitis. And medial epicondylitis can occur with overuse of the forearm flexors that attach here. And the question is, what innervates the forearm flexors? The correct answer is the median nerve. However, from one of our previous lectures in this chapter regarding the median and ulnar nerves, we discussed that the flexor digitorum profundus, or FDP, is innervated by both the median and the ulnar nerves. So if you said the ulnar nerve, you'd technically be correct. But the best thing to think of is that forearm flexors, all besides the FDP, which shares its innervation with the ulnar nerve, are innervated by the median nerve. Now let's move on to the anatomy of the wrist. This table shows the material that you must know for step one regarding the wrist. Let's start with the scaphoid bone. This image shows the carpal bones. The only bones that you really need to be familiar with are the ones labeled here. We have the hamate, the lunate, and the scaphoid. Those are the three carpal bones that you need to be familiar with. Now, a scaphoid bone fracture can result in avascular necrosis, as written here. This idea is discussed in detail in the cardiovascular anatomy chapter, when all the vasculature is thoroughly discussed. And we taught it with this image. Looking down at the hand, we can see the radial artery, and it branches into the dorsal scaphoid branch. With scaphoid bone fractures, this artery, the dorsal scaphoid artery, is unable to supply the proximal part of the scaphoid bone, resulting in necrosis. Specifically, the proximal part of the scaphoid bone. We just talked about the scaphoid bone, and fracture here can result in avascular necrosis. And these fractures often occur from a fall, a fall fracture. And with a fracture here, the dorsal scaphoid branch cannot supply the proximal bone. Now let's discuss the lunate bone. Damage to this bone can also result from a fall fracture. This can result in lunate dislocation, which can compress the median nerve. We see the lunate bone labeled here, and it's commonly fractured when a person falls on their outstretched hand. And if they do that, you can see that it can actually damage the distal radius in this region. You see the radius labeled here. So that means whenever somebody falls on an outstretched hand, you should be thinking of three bones, the radius, the lunate, and the scaphoid bone. You can see that they all articulate with one another right through here. And since they all articulate, you should think of all three of them with outstretched hand falls. Okay, now focusing just again on the lunate bone. Just know that the median nerve is close by. Know that it's commonly fractured with falls and can also compress the median nerve. Now let's talk about the hamate bone. And when we talk about the hamate bone, it's really important to also talk about Guyon's canal. So we have the hamate bone up here. And if there's ever damage to the hamate bone or even Guyon's canal, think of them both together, then there can be damage to the ulnar nerve, which is located near this bone. To better understand the Guyon's canal though, we need a different perspective. So this image right here shows the Guyon's canal. The ulnar nerve, we can see labeled here, travels within this. If this area is compressed, as can occur with like holding handlebars on a bike. You can imagine that the handlebar goes through this area, then it can compress Guyon's canal and therefore compress the ulnar nerve. In this image, you can also see the hamate bone labeled here. And if the hamate bone is damaged, this can also result in compression and damage of the ulnar nerve. And from this perspective, it's harder to appreciate that the hamate bone is really close to the ulnar nerve. So it's really important to remember that these are really close in proximity. So if you damage the hamate, you're gonna damage the ulnar nerve. Now you can see the median nerve labeled here. I don't want you to associate the median nerve with the hamate bone. So I'm gonna cross out the hamate bone. The median nerve should be more associated with the carpal tunnel. And the carpal tunnel kind of refers to this whole region here. With repetitive use injuries, as often occurs with overuse of the flexor tendons, which we see labeled here, inflammation can occur in the carpal tunnel. And this results in carpal tunnel syndrome, which is pain and tingling of the skin that's innervated by the median nerve. So again, we discussed the hamate bone and Guyon's canal. If there's injury to the hook of the hamate, there can be ulnar nerve palsy. And if there's compression of the Guyon's canal, which can occur with handlebar compression, there can be ulnar nerve palsy. We also just discussed the carpal tunnel. And carpal tunnel syndrome can occur from repetitive use injury of the flexor tendons, which can lead to median nerve palsy, or pain and tingling in the median nerve distribution. Now let's do one last question to apply what you've learned. A nine-year-old boy falls out of a tree and embraces the impact directly with the palm of his hand. What bones are commonly injured with this type of fall? And what nerve may be injured? Whenever someone falls on an outstretched hand, the radius can be fractured. So I will write R right here. Also, the two carpal bones that articulate with the radius can be damaged. The scaphoid bone right here and the lunate bone right here. 
Recall that scaphoid damage can result in avascular necrosis, whereas lunate dislocation can result in median nerve compression. So this answers both parts of the question. What bones are commonly injured with this type of fall? The radius and the two carpal bones that articulate with it, the scaphoid and lunate, and what nerve may be injured? The median nerve. And that concludes this section.